Hello, friends. Welcome to the Career Guru Podcast. I am your host, Steve Yanofsky. What a glorious day it is to start your path on a new career. Doors are opening here at the Boston Career Institute even as we speak. And I'm here holding the key for you. So tune in, stay sharp, and enjoy yourself. This is going to be great. Hashtag Let's Career Up. Good day, everyone. Welcome to the newest installment of the Career Guru Podcast. Welcome to all of our conversationalists, career seekers, thrill seekers, all across the fruited plain. It is my pleasure today to welcome Dr. Ben Sherman. It's doctor, isn't it? It is technically, yes. So I, I can't, can't write prescriptions right now. <laughs> well, maybe one day. Ben, do me a favor. Please introduce yourself to our audience and uh, let's take it from there. All right. Thanks very much, Steve. I'm Ben Sherman, Dr. Ben, because of my PhD, which means I can prescribe only books, I'm afraid. But I'm currently the program manager of the Bridges Returning Citizen Center, which is a program within Mass Hire Metro North Career Centers that works specifically with people getting out of incarceration to help find jobs or, in some cases, career training programs to help them take some steps towards, you know, rebuilding and starting to, you know, grow their, their prosperity and success. That's fantastic. You know, this has been a uh, point of great interest to me over the many years. I can tell you right personally that I have written to every governor that has been in the, my life since I've been in professional service to try to influence the quarry laws that we have on the books to try and see if we can assist people find meaningful life. It used to be in this country that when you spent time in, in jail and you came out, you had paid your debt to society and you could have picked up where you left off prior to commission of a, of a crime and serving time. But today it's no longer the case, is it? No, not, not particularly. Uh, and part of this is due to, you know, just, you know, the generally greater, uh, ease of getting information, right? Electronic transfer of records make things a lot faster, but a lot of this is due to policy decisions at one level or another. When people gain criminal records, um, you know, part of what the system is set up to do, you know, meeting out whatever uh, penalties are applied to those records, is to leave those records to some degree or another publicly viewable. And how much they're viewable and how long uh, really varies all over the place state to state. And within Massachusetts, it varies industry to industry. There are some industries where, you know, they may only be able to see, you know, five years of misdemeanors and 10 years of felonies with some exceptions. Um, but in other industries, they'll be able to see uh, a record going as far back as it goes un until and unless someone chooses to have uh, it or is able to have their record sealed. Well, this is really uh, what I wanted to focus on and talk a little bit from your area of expertise about sealing those records, you know, because in my career, I've encountered many, many women in particular who received sentences, suspended sentences. They never served time, but the criminal record is there. So the attorney that represented them had uh, saved them from going to jail, but people don't understand that just because you didn't go to jail doesn't mean that you don't have a criminal record. So a lot of them are innocent bystanders for domestic offenses and so on and so forth. And it's a, it's a terrible injustice that the, the best you can do with your life is to work the fry later somewhere at Wendy's. And by the way, uh, nothing against working the fry later in Wendy's, but that's not necessarily a long-term career goal for someone with several children or even on their own. So speak to us, if you could, a little bit about sealing the record and what gets sealed, what can be sealed. And I know you're not an attorney. That day will come and we will get somebody on board, but let's get us started to see what what can be done because you work specifically with your clients to try to get this done. Sure. So let me see. I'll, I'll start with the basics and almost everything I say here is going to come with a little aside that says, you know, with some exceptions, et cetera, et cetera. And happy to dig in a little more, uh, the details if you want, but more or less the idea is this, when, uh, someone has uh, criminal convictions, then those are going to show up on their criminal record for a fair while. In fact, technically it'll show up in your criminal record until you've done something about it. Uh, though there are some employers that won't see the whole criminal record, uh, where it'll, it'll sort of stop past a certain date. 
but convictions are generally going to show up and open cases will pretty much always show up if someone does a search. So if you go in, try to work someplace, you know, you gave us an example, Wendy's, um, if you go into Wendy's, it's up to them whether or not they want to bother with a criminal record search. But if they do, you know, as an employer with no special obligations, uh, they can make a request to see your criminal record. If they just request it from the state, they will see only your state criminal record. But there are a lot of third-party background check companies that will uh, offer to check multiple states, that will try and check federal records, things like that. So there's lots of different records out there. Um, and one question is how you uh, was provided on different background checks. But to keep it simple, I'll talk mostly about the Cori, which is the Massachusetts criminal record. If someone uh, asks to see that, then they will see for sure any open cases you have in Massachusetts. Uh, they will see any felony convictions from recent years, and they will see any misdemeanor convictions from recent years. How recent depends on the industries. If, if it's Wendy's, they're going to see your last 10 years of felonies. They're going to see your last five years of misdemeanors, except there's a few types of crimes where they can see all the way back. Homicide and sex offenses don't age out that way. Uh, you'll be able to see as far back as you want to go. You can make it, uh, you can make it so that uh, an ordinary um, background check will not see your record through a process called sealing once you're eligible. And the idea is you are eligible to seal your record so people will not see it. It's a certain amount of time after either your last conviction or the end of your last incarceration, whichever is later. And the clock that you need to run out on those is seven years for felonies, three years for misdemeanors, and there's a few exceptions out there. I, could I just wanted to want. quickly, quickly chime in, if possible, for our audience. I wanted to clarify the difference between misdemeanors and felonies. So misdemeanors in Massachusetts are lesser crimes, if you will. You know, things like shoplifting, you know, public disturbances. Uh, felonies are significantly more serious, and that's why they're sort of represented the, this way. For misdemeanors, the, the three-year look-back period and felonies, seven-year, correct? In, in Massachusetts, I just want people to understand what we're talking about. And of course, like you mentioned, murders and sex offenses are, you know, they, they, they don't have a clock. This is, this is forever. Please, I'm sorry, uh, continue. No problem. So sealing lets you take the record out of you sooner. And one of the tricks is, uh, one of the tricks about that is uh, you can't seal your record until everything on your record is ready to seal. So if you have a 15-year-old felony, but, you know, if that was the only thing on there, great, you'd be ready to seal it. But if you got a conviction for a misdemeanor two years ago, then you're not going to be able to seal that old felony until that new misdemeanor is also ready to seal. Um, so when it comes to sealing records, it's all or it's nothing. When it comes to sealing records, you actually can seal homicides. They work about the same as any other felony. You know, the clock starts ticking after someone gets out of prison. So they've been in prison for 20 years for a homicide. Then now's when the clock starts to wait seven years. Sex offenses can also be sealed, but it takes a little longer. And I, I think someone has to be off the sex offender registry to be able to do that. There are a few kinds of unsealable crimes. Um, they, you know, those get into weird details. Uh, I think the, the one I most often see become an issue for someone is... Uh, 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 crimes can be unsealable if they involve, uh, I think the term is interfering with public justice, which means, you know, if you tried to bribe a court official or something like that, I don't see those often. The one I do see sometimes is people sometimes get charged with witness intimidation. So I've seen that a few times. And then that means that record will not be sealable. That, that crime can never be sealed, at least given how it's currently categorized. So the benefit of sealing is that when you do this, most employers will stop being able to see your record. Sealing it doesn't mean it disappears. Courts will still see it. The FBI can still see it, law enforcement. And there's a tiny set of employers that can actually see sealed records having to do with especially like you know, early childhood education, uh, I believe is one of the few industries where they can uh, actually see through the sealing of the record. You know, you can think of it as like locking it in a safe, but a few entities get to look inside the safe and see your record. But for most industries, they will no longer be able to see whatever on the record you seal. 
If you get new convictions after that, they'll see the new convictions, but not the old sealed stuff. Um, so sealing is a great idea when you have the option. It's also, I mentioned that um, if you go into Wendy's, they'll only be seeing your last 10 years of felonies, your last five years of misdemeanors if your record is unsealed. But there's other industries, including, say, elder care, where they will be able to see all the way back until you seal it. So for some industries, sealing is really necessary to honestly get started at all in some of these industries. So a lot of it depends on, on what you want to do. But almost always re we recommend for people, if your uh, record is eligible to seal, it's a good idea to do so. You've done your time. You've gone long enough since your last convictions that you really should be able to put that record behind you. And it just takes potential problems off the table when you have the record sealed. Makes uh, makes uh, sense. I do have uh, a question to ask. Who can actually seal the record? Can a person individually seal the record? Or do you need to hire a special specialized attorney for that? Yeah, good question. Uh, Massachusetts has made sealing an old record pretty easy. So yeah, it, it's never a bad idea to have someone advising you, but they, they made it pretty easy that when your record is old enough to be eligible to seal, it's like a one-page form. You, you fill out your information. You don't have to list all the different crimes. You don't have to list different courts. You just have to say, like, I have, I think you do have to check, do you have misdemeanors and felonies? Check a couple boxes, fill something out, and a single form you mail in uh, to the commissioner of probation. Then you wait, because it's paperwork and it's not fast. Uh, lately, I think clients have been seeing around a three-month wait for this thing to clear. Uh, but when it gets through, there it is. That's it. When the record's old enough, it should just... Uh, you know, one piece of paper makes it all go through. Legislation has been proposed, by the way, and I think is is still, you know, getting batted around somewhere in uh, the halls of the legislature that would have the sealing be automatic. Because right now it's like, you can get this sealed, but you have to know to ask and you have to, you know, find the piece of paper to, to send it. Um, once you have that, it's easy. Well, if we're going to make it that easy, why not just have it be automatic and say, you know, once you hit the eligibility point, the whole record, you know, gets locked up. So obviously we'd love to see that, but we're not there yet. So in, in my program, we spend a lot of time talking with people about when they'll be ready to seal and getting them the forms they need if they're ready. Would you recommend that people check their own query just to make sure? I mean, every one of us has interaction with the law at one point in time. The question is, what ends up in your query? Is there an easy way for someone to check their own query? Walk us through that if possible. Uh, sure. So, you know, usually when, when clients ask me this, I have, I have a little block of text I send to them just with, with some instructions, but simply put like, yeah, the government office that manages Corey's, uh, the DCGIS, um, which is the department of criminal justice information services has a pretty straightforward way that you can order your own Corey. Standardly, they charge you 25 bucks, but there's a way to fill out an additional form, an affidavit of indigency. If $25 is, you know, going to be a burden because the idea is they want everyone to be able to see this. They're just trying to get those that can afford the 25 bucks to, you know, pay for the process and they will get you fairly quickly an electronic copy of your full Corey record, your full criminal Massachusetts criminal background record. And when I say full, you asked a, a good question, which is what do you see on there? Basically what you see on there is all cases that did not end in full acquittal. So, you know, open cases are certainly still going to show up as open. The convictions are going to show up as convictions. There's a couple of other things that happen a fair amount of the time, which is, you know, if the court sort of doesn't want to go through the whole process of, you know, bringing something to trial and the person would just assume not bring the whole process to trial, then a lot of times you'll see one of a couple of uh, non-conviction findings on there. Sometimes it'll say uh, NP for uh, nola, nola prosecuti, just court declines to prosecute, means they decided not to go forward with it. Great. Now you don't have to worry about, you know, punishment to prison, but it does still show up on a record. And sometimes what you'll see is something ending to a dismissal. Often it'll be, dis you know, they'll offer a person, hey, if you do, you know, a certain amount of time of probation, you know, sort of accept pretrial probation. And then if you get through the probation without, the pro without a problem, then we'll dismiss the charges. So you just, you see dismissals also. Dismissal again, great. You weren't convicted. Um, you didn't have a punishment beyond the probation. 
So that's good. But again, it will be there on your record. Now, when I say it's on your record, that doesn't mean everyone sees it. And just going with Wendy's, where we start as an example, Wendy's and most businesses that don't have any particular obligation to check court, uh, check criminal records will only see convictions in open cases. Uh, so they won't see the dismissals. Generally, they won't see the, uh, the non-prosecutions. Uh, but there's a pretty wide range of businesses that, uh, especially those working with vulnerable populations, where they have one of those heightened levels of visibility and they will be able to see uh, non-prosecutions as well as, uh, uh, yeah, uh, non-convictions as well as convictions, as long as it didn't lead to a full not guilty finding. So if instead of proving you guilty, the court just said, yeah, how about we just drop this? They'll be able to see that the the court didn't sort of, you know, find you not guilty. It just stopped checking. And in some fields, that can remain a problem. Now, I also mentioned since we talked about the sealing process a minute ago, non-convictions can actually be sealed through their own process. So you don't have to wait the full, you know, seven for felony, three for misdemeanor to seal non-convictions, but it's a slightly more complicated process. You need to petition the court. You need to fill out a narrative. Um, when we've had clients need to do this process, usually it's not just as simple as here's the form, fill it out, send it in. Usually we do more sitting with people, figure out how many different courts they need to petition. And just since you need to kind of tell more your story, give more of a rationale, uh, we'll more often, you know, sit there and work through, uh, the narrative with them. Again, it's the sort of thing where a, uh, a lawyer wouldn't hurt, but you know, someone who's able to put their thoughts in order generally should be able to do this, at least with assistance. Non-convictions, also worth knowing about. I asked a couple minutes ago, should everyone go check their quarry? And, you know, because it costs $25, I wouldn't say, like, everyone do it every month. But if someone who has been court-involved, someone who has been to court, someone who has been through, you know, some sort of process, certainly someone who's been convicted or incarcerated, before they go back to job search, really for uh, housing search too, we do recommend they get a copy of their quarry because when you go apply for jobs or apply for housing, you want to know what people are going to see. And also, you want to just check that it's right. We've definitely seen cases where due to just sort of a paperwork error, a case that should have been closed, that should have been dismissed, that should have been effectively kind of out of someone's life is still showing up as open just because like, Someone forgot to check a box somewhere. You never know, so it's good to check, make sure, and sometimes those errors can be resolved fairly quickly. We've even heard of people with very common names ending up with someone else's, like, you know, court appearances accidentally on their record. It's not something I've seen myself, but through the rumor mill, we've, we've heard about such things happening. Oh, certainly. So just when, once you're court involved, you're, uh, you, you have greater chances of a paperwork error becoming part of your life. So we definitely recommend it when someone's starting out a process and checking again whenever someone thinks there's been a change. If someone has requested their record be sealed, they get back notice that it's sealed, we recommend check it again just to make sure that you know what an employer or landlord is going to see. Yes, yes, absolutely. Just another quick question for you. Once you had your record sealed and let's say you were involved in a misdemeanor, will your record automatically reopen? Nothing that I know of will automatically reopen your record. So like if, if you catch an, you know, if you get convicted for new crime, it doesn't reopen the old stuff. New stuff will appear when someone does a record check. The old stuff remains sealed. Now, like I say, sealed is different from destroyed. It's out there somewhere. You know, the courts and those with extra special access can see it. And there are situations where, and I've mostly heard about this involving like immigration stuff. I've heard of situations where people need to unseal their record for one reason or another. Also, people who want to go back and try to challenge an old conviction in court, I believe, again, have to reopen their record uh, in order to have the, the case reexamined. But those sorts of unsealing generally take action on the, on the part of the person you know, who needs their record unsealed again. Phenomenal information and great insight, Ben. May I ask for you to tell us a little bit about what you do right now, because a lot of the people listening will want to reach out and uh, see if they can take uh, advantage of the programs that you're working with. Let's talk a little bit about that and uh, 
see what kind of a response we get. And maybe, just maybe, if we get enough, maybe you could consider coming back and talking some more about some of the particulars. Would that be okay? Sure, happy to. All right. Well, tell us a little bit about what you do right now in the agency that you're working with and, and how people can reach out to uh, Mass Hire and specifically your program. Uh, let's hear a little bit about that. Sure. So let's see, as far as the agency I'm part of, that this is a little bit complicated, but we're, we're part of ABCD, Action for Boston Community Development, you know, a major uh, human services nonprofit based in Boston. And ABCD is the organization that operates Mass Hire Metro North Career Centers. So there's Mass Hire Centers all over the place, uh, all over the state, um, but different regions will be run by different operators. So we you know, we were sort of created by ABCD to be a new program within Mass Hire Metro North. Uh, day to day, we sit in Cambridge, but we have offices in Woburn and Chelsea as well. So, you know, when we have cause to go visiting, when someone, you know, wants to meet in person, we'll, we'll pop out to those offices. So uh, a lot of the way we, uh, we try and get started with people is when possible, we want to get out there and talk to people who are still incarcerated and particularly those who are kind of beginning to approach their release dates. So we've gone out and talked to people uh, and held workshops in a number of facilities. Uh, we've also done kind of re-entry panels or re-entry uh, um, re fairs at a number of facilities. And those are chances to, you know, more or less in-depth, give the people we talk to a sort of quick primer about, you know, what are sort of, sort of the challenges and what are the things they want to get ready to do in order to hit the ground running and start finding work when they get out. Uh, you know, when we get a longer dedicated workshop, we'll talk through strategy, we'll talk through people's specific interests. When all we have is a re-entry fair, it'll just be sort of like a, you know, quick two or three questions. Get enough info from people that we'll be able to make contact with them when they get out. We make sure they have our flyers. When possible, get info so we can reach out to them through either their own phone and email or someone who'll know how to reach them. So that, you know, right about the point when someone is out and trying to figure out what do I do next... We're there to help with, with those steps. And then whether people come to us through this sort of reentry pipeline or whether they come to us through community partners, referrals, people calling us out of the blue, we're really happy to work with anyone who has a history of incarceration. So most of our people are, you know, got out recently, but we have a handful of people who, you know, got out years ago, but their, you know, prison experience or the criminal history is sort of still with them and still posing challenges. So anyone facing those challenges can work with our program, say, as long as they are work eligible adult Massachusetts residents. At that point, we, you know, just begin with a conversation about what someone's trying to do, what they're already doing, what they need immediately, what they want long term. Um, and, you know, there's some things that are going to be pretty standard. We talk with someone about their job search process. We talk with them about what kinds of industries are going to be relatively open and welcoming to people with records, which industries are going to be fairly unwelcoming, and which industries are kind of in between and, you know, may consider if you make a good enough impression. With pretty much everyone, we're going to be doing stuff like resume review. And then in a lot of cases, it's going to be more targeted. Some people, especially those getting out after 15, 20, 25 years, may really be not very familiar with the process of searching for jobs and applying online. So if so, we're going to walk with them through as much of that process as we need. Some people are, are you know, pretty ready to go in terms of the, the job search. And really all we're doing is kind of editing, refining, and then, you know, seeing if we can, say, make connections with people who are part of employer partner networks of either mass hire or, or partner organizations. So sometimes we'll just jump right to like, hey, you're pretty ready to go. Let's just make some tweaks and do some referrals. And then we offer ongoing coaching and case management pretty much as long as folks are looking for it. We find that after incarceration, for a lot of people, it's going to be a couple of steps. Like there's jobs they want to do, but I'd say the most common is there's jobs they want to do, but to do some of the jobs they want, you know, often warehouse work or construction, HVAC, something like that, they really need to be back on the road. And a, a lot of people, especially getting out of prison, uh, you know, may have lost their licenses, licenses expired, may owe money to the RMV. So there may be this whole process of you need to get some kind of job, make some money before you can go get the jobs you want. But for others, it's an interest in getting some sort of new training or certification, which a lot of times, you know, mass hires can provide funding for, but it'll be, you know, a two, three month program 
So it's not as easy as just like, hey, this won't cost you anything, go do it. Because a two, three month program is going to be two, three months when, you know, maybe you don't have income coming in or at least not full-time income. So for a lot of people, there's a process of kind of get enough money saved up that they can afford to take a few months to go learn HVAC skills or get a commercial driver's license or something like that. So that kind of long-term planning or, you know, short and long-term planning, um, you know, uh, application preparation, guidance about training programs, guidance about target industries, that's sort of the core of what we do. And then on a case-by-case basis, we figure out what else is needed and what else we can do to help. So how can people find uh, your organization? Not you in particular, but uh, unless you wanted to reach out to, how can they find you? One way to go about it is, uh, you know, if you Google mass hire Metro North and returning citizens, uh, that should lead, uh, bring you to our page. You know, those who would rather sort of Google and read up on it first, that's the way to go. But otherwise, we have a main contact number. Uh, people could call or text us at 617-468-8918. Um, and that, that number goes to is sort of our, our main intake number. And from there, we've, you know, we'll assign career advisors uh, to people who get in touch with us that way. Fantastic. Well, there's enough information for us for several uh, Career Guru podcasts. Uh, and I know that feedback is going to be absolutely tremendous. So I'd love to have you back at some point in time. Dr. Sherman, thank you so very much. It's been very enlightening, informative, and uh, refreshing uh, in many ways. Uh, glad to speak with you. Very happy to learn all of this and share this knowledge with uh, our listeners. Thank you once again. Thank you very much. Hey, thanks for having me, Steve. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. I'll be in touch with you. Well, friends and aspiring career gurus, this was fun. Thank you for tuning in. I feel enlightened. I feel empowered. And I'm feeling grateful that we spend time with you. For more information about Boston Career Institute, please visit our website, bostoncareer.org. Boston Career Institute has three campuses located in Brookline, Massachusetts, Malden, Massachusetts, and Lowell, Massachusetts. Call our toll-free number, 888-383-6058. For questions, comments, and or information about our podcast, email me at thecareerguru at bostoncareer.org. The Career Guru Podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, our website, bostoncareer.org, or wherever you stream your podcast. Subscribe, stream, rate, and review our shows. Your rating and reviews help our show reach new audiences. Produced by PodPro Entertainment, the Career Guru lives within a network of podcasts located at podproentertainment.com. Hashtag the new radio. Looking forward to seeing you soon. All the best to you. My name is Steve Yanofsky. I am the career guru. May God bless you. Hashtag let's career up.